When I was 18 years old, I left my home in Olympia, Washington to chase a dream of one day building my own cabin in the woods of Alaska. I had no money, no tools, no land, and no idea how to build anything. But 15 years later, that dream is now a reality. And today I'm going to tell you how I made it happen. All right, welcome back to Alaska Cabin Adventures. Today I'm going to tell you exactly how I built this cabin, and I'm going to tell you how much it costs, and I'm going to break it down for you in seven steps that you should be able to follow to build your own off-grid cabin. I also have some really exciting news to tell you pertaining to the channel, so let's get into it. So let's talk about selecting land. My cabin is located here in the interior of Alaska, and uh, I own about two and a half acres. I think one of the most important factors when selecting land is what sort of recreational opportunities there are around. Where I'm at, there's world-class fishing, hunting, snow machining, uh, there's lakes, rivers, mountains, just about everything that Alaska has to offer. So being centrally located amongst all the types of outdoor activities that I wanted to do was my main reason for wanting to have a cabin in the area that I have it. So once you've decided generally where you want to be, then there's a few other considerations you want to think about. A big one is going to be your soil. Um, you can have soil tests done on the different uh, plots that you're looking at. The drier the ground, the better, especially if you're somewhere that freezes like Alaska, so you don't get frost heaving and different problems like that. And there's also the consideration of how deep down water is if you wanted to do a well or septic or something like that. So what you don't want is soil that has uh, a lot of heavies like clay and silt. What you do want is well-drained soil like sand and gravel. And ideally, if you can get down to the actual bedrock with your foundation, um, that's even better. The land that I have here is actually sort of perched up on a little knoll that overlooks the pond. So while most of the land around me is pretty boggy, I'm up on a nice sandy little hill. So say you're looking for a lot, you find an acre somewhere, um, you wanna consider how many trees are on the property. Getting all the trees cleared out is a pretty big undertaking, uh, depending on how many there are and what type they are. Not only do you have to clear the trees, but you also have to get the stumps out. And the, getting the stumps out is a major problem. Um, I actually had someone come out and grind down the remaining stumps that I had on my property after the trees were cleared out, but even still the stumps stuck up a lot and the roots were there and it was a real pain in the butt. And um, just another consideration is how many trees are on it and how much clearing needs to be done before you can actually start to put in a cabin. Another consideration is how remote is your land? We all love the idea of being totally alone out in the wilderness on a totally remote property, but in reality accessing that property can be nearly impossible. Um, it also makes just the logistics of building way crazier, getting all your um, timbers brought out, you know, and if you forget one bit or a box of screws or something like that, you know, there could go your entire weekend in terms of building because you have to go all the way back to town to get it. Having that woods feel, but having amenities that aren't too far away is a really nice thing. And I've kind of hit the sweet spot here at my cabin. I'm only about an hour or so from the nearest town. So that's been nice, especially as a beginning builder. So consider a location that has fun things to do, good soil, easy access to water, maybe something that's not too far away from town. It's something that will be within your means for getting cleared out and ready for building. The last and probably the most important thing to consider when buying land is what you can afford. Out here in this neck of the woods of Alaska, it's really affordable. I got my first acre for $10,000 and I got the adjacent lot after that for another, I think $5,000. So I paid about 15,000 bucks for two and a half acres. When I bought the land, I was like maybe 23 or 24 years old and I didn't have a lot of money. Working as a musician, I was pretty broke. So um, I took out a land loan, which is about 25% down, and then they financed the rest over, I think, a period of about eight years. So I had to save up 2,500 bucks uh, to put down. And then after that, I was able to pay it off in you know chunks of about, I think about 150 bucks a month or something like that. And whenever I'd come into a little bit of extra cash, I'd, I'd put the money towards it and just get it paid off. And uh, all these years later, I own the land outright, and I pay about $150 per lot on property taxes and then the structure i pay about four to five hundred dollars in property taxes and that's per year so about six seven hundred bucks total in property taxes for both lots and my structure all right so once you've got your land all figured out you're going to need some tools for building and you don't need a whole bunch of crazy expensive tools so one of the most important tips that i can give you guys is pawn shops have really cheap tools and they work just fine I built the majority of this cabin with a circular saw, just a single plug-in circular saw that I got at a pawn shop for $10. And uh, it definitely wasn't ideal, but I got the job done with it. So let me take you guys inside my tool shed and I'll show you a few of the things that I used. So here's a few things that I think you absolutely need if you're gonna be stick framing a building. And uh, the first is of course a circular saw. Whether or not it has a cord or not is up to you. Um, I had a corded one that I ran off a generator, but cordless ones are nice. Just remember that you have to keep cycling out your batteries. So if you're gonna get um, cordless tools, 
try to get them all in the same brand, like all DeWalt, so that way your batteries are compatible with all your different tools. Okay, besides a circular saw, I think a jigsaw is a really nice tool to have, especially for cutting out um, any kind of like weird shapes on small things. The other essential saw that you're gonna need is a reciprocating saw, also known as like a sawzall. And uh, those are just really good if you have to cut through nails or different types of metal. I also used it for cutting out the hole in my ceiling where my chimney went through. So circular saw, a sawzall, and a jigsaw are the three most important saws to have. One thing I didn't have until later, but really wished I did, is this chop saw. If you guys don't have a chop saw, just do yourself a favor and invest in one. You won't regret it. Then of course you need all the small things, all the carpenter's essentials like a square, a level, pencils. You need tape measures, hammers. So when I first started, I thought I was gonna put the whole thing together with just screws and a drill. And I quickly realized that that was absolutely nuts. And I went out and bought a cheap air compressor and then an air powered framing hammer. You really need air powered tools. You can't be sitting there trying to screw in every nail. You're gonna be shooting hundreds and hundreds of nails to put in the sheathing. Get yourself a small air compressor and a few air tools, uh, a framing hammer and a roofing hammer, which you can kind of use the same gun for both of those. And then some smaller ones like brad nailers and things like that for when you start doing your trim. Another thing you're probably gonna need is a truck. If you don't have a vehicle that can haul heavy loads of concrete and lumber and different building materials, you're not gonna get very far. And then having some kind of lumber trailer is also really nice to have. When I first started, I just bought a really cheap tow behind camper. So while I was building the cabin, I had a dry place to stay and sleep. And that was really a nice thing to have. Unless you're gonna go full Dick Pernicky style and do everything by hand, you have to consider how you're gonna power all this stuff. So I use a Yamaha 2000 watt generator slash inverter. And that did the trick for pretty much all of the building that I had to do. It did come up short with pushing one of my air compressors, so I had to buy a smaller air compressor. I know there's a lot of new off-grid um, power station solutions right now. I'm actually gonna be testing some of those out here pretty soon, but I don't really know how those hold up to actually using like power tools. Um, we'll see. All right, so you've got your land, you've got some tools, now it's time to actually start building. So the first thing you're gonna need for any cabin is a good foundation. For my foundation, I decided to do concrete piers, which are way more resistant to frost heaving. Depending on the type of soil and weather and different conditions that you have, there's lots of different foundation options. So just look out for your local area and decide what's best for you. If you guys are in Alaska or in a cold weather place, concrete piers are a really great way to go. They get you down below the frost line and they're really resistant to things like frost heaving. So what I did was I went out to Home Depot and I rented a power auger for digging post holes. That is the best 50 bucks I've ever spent. The auger that I really recommend using is the one that uses its own motor weight as a counter um, to pull the auger back out of the ground so that one person can run it. Those handheld augers can really be hard to do. Even if you're super big and strong, that's a tough tool to run. Um, so the one that has a counterweight just makes it super nice. You just dig it in, it digs you a perfect four foot hole and poof, push down and pop it right back out. So I got all nine of my piers dug in one afternoon with a $50 rental and it was awesome. After that, I just got six inch sauna tubes, which are basically uh, cardboard retaining tubes for the concrete and popped them in the holes and then leveled those out before I put concrete in them. The way I leveled them was really uh, just by the seat of my pants. I just took a string and a level and just sort of ran them, um, ran the string from side to side. And you also wanna measure and make sure that all of your corners are square. Okay, so then once I had the sauna tubes put in and leveled, I went ahead and um, rented a concrete mixer, another easy rental from Home Depot. I think that one was even cheaper, like 30 bucks a day. And I put it in the back of my truck and brought it out here with a bunch of bags of quick crete concrete mix and then use the water from the pond and the concrete mixer to mix them up and then pour and fill those in and then what you want to do while the concrete's still wet is consider what sort of mounting bracket you're going to put in those concrete tubes so that way you can mount your beams or whatever you want to do so once i had my sauna tubes leveled concrete poured brackets put in then i hauled in the heaviest pieces of lumber which were the 20 foot beams and they were 20 feet long and then four inches by 12 inches. And they're also treated, which means that they're extra wet. And so those were really, really heavy beams that I had to move by myself. Um, and when it comes to moving around heavy beams, remember that pivoting is a really powerful function. So basically I just put one beam down, picked up the other side and spun it around and then put it down, picked up the other side, spun it around and put that one down. So you can get a lot done with some good pivoting. So with my sauna tubes placed and my beams put in and secured, it was time to build a subfloor. And that's gonna take us to our next section, which is framing. So framing is really the meat and potatoes of your build. It consists of everything from 
your subfloor to your walls, your roof, your sheathing. It's putting the actual structure together. I'm not gonna go over the framing basics. There's plenty of videos out there and plenty of people who are smarter than me when it comes to framing that you can learn from. I use treated lumber for my subfloor just because I wanted anything that was exposed to the elements to be treated to make sure the cabin was gonna last a long time. And then I use tongue and groove, three quarter inch plywood as my subfloor decking, just to make sure that I had a really solid floor that wasn't gonna squeak or bow or anything like that. The most important thing to consider when framing is that you have to have your windows and doors purchased or at least measured prior to framing. How you frame out the openings and the headers and different things is all specific to your doors and windows. So I got all my windows on Craigslist. I had a guy who just was a carpenter and he ripped out all sorts of um, windows and kept them in his backyard. So I got all the windows and door for this cabin for 300 bucks. I also learned something from the guy I got all my doors and windows from. He taught me how to frame out the octagon window that I had in there. He convinced me into buying that octagon window and in fact, he threw it in for free. I wasn't gonna take it because I was too intimidated by the dimensions trying to figure out how to frame it. He said, oh, an octagon's easy. You just build a square and 245's in the corners and away you go. So anyway, you, you learn lots of stuff from the people that you get stuff from. Another big consideration for framing is how you get up to the high places. A ladder is fine once you have a structure to lean it against, but if you don't have walls or fascia board or a roof or anything like that, you have to have a way to get up there. So we built something called the death wagon, which was um, basically we took two by sixes that were laying around and we built scaffolding onto my lumber trailer. And we used that as a way to get up high. So we'd back that death wagon up and around and it was really cool because it was mobile. So we could back it up to the sides of the cabin and access the high spots. We called it the death wagon because it was on wheels and had suspension. And so that wobbled super crazy up there and it's way up off the ground. And we were hauling up big sheets of plywood and lumber and different things like that. And it was pretty terrifying. So, uh, but anyway, scaffolding, different types of ladders or build yourself a death wagon. After you get the walls raised and put together, it's time to consider a roof. And there's a couple ways to go for a roof. I wanted a cathedral ceiling. And if you're gonna do cathedral ceilings that don't have cross beams or rafter ties, they're called, you're gonna need a ridge beam, which is a big, huge, heavy beam that goes across the center point of the cabin. Uh, but there is another option, and that's what I did, which is uh, having trusses made. So a truss is a prefabricated uh, roof support that you can have made by local building supply stores. And mine was only about, I think, $1,000 to have all of the trusses made for the whole cabin. They offer all that nice open ceiling for things like a loft. Not only that, they usually give you a lot more space in the ceiling itself for adding insulation and ventilation. So once we had all the walls and roof done with the framing, it was time to start sheathing. And one of the important things to remember about plywood is that it adds a ton of rigidity and structural strength to the framing. So before you get working on your roof, it's nice to go around and do a single row of sheathing around the bottom to just lock those walls in. That's what we did and it made the whole structure feel much more solid before we got up onto the roof and started adding the trusses. Getting those heavy pieces of plywood up and uh, nailing them in with the air nailer is tough work, but there's little tricks of the trade like putting in support boards for them or having your buddy hold them for you, different things like that. So um, just work smarter, not harder. And then the more sheathing that you get, the more it starts to all of a sudden feel like a cabin, which is the exciting part. Um, and it also starts to really firm up, like I said. So getting things sheathed is nice. I went ahead and sheathed around the whole thing and then used um, a Sawzall to cut out the openings in the windows rather than cutting out the, the sheathing to the structure. So basically I just went around, sheathed the whole thing, went in and then cut out the openings for the doors and windows. So that's framing, you're gonna build a subfloor, put up your walls, build a roof, and then go ahead and sheathe the whole thing so you have a solid structure. And then comes a very exciting step, which is weathering the cabin in. So to let you guys know, I do have a full tour video as well that kind of shows you all around the cabin and uh, shows you the outbuildings like my wood-fired sauna and tool shed and all that stuff. Um, so that's a whole separate video. I will put a link to it at the end of this video. So keep an eye out for that one. All right, so number five, weathering the cabin in. This is uh, kind of an exciting step because it's when you really can go from just having a structure to something that's actually livable. Weathering in your cabin basically means that um, it's gonna be resistant to rain or snow or different things like that. So the problem with weathering a cabin in is that by this point you'll be exhausted. You've put in tons of work and it's really common that people stop right after this step. They get their cabin weathered in and that's the last thing they ever do on it just because it's been so overwhelming getting to that point. Their funds are depleted. So uh, it's really common, especially up here in Alaska, to see a lot of cabins that are just wrapped in Tyvek. Keep on working after this step. But basically weathering in, um, what I did was started by uh, wrapping the whole cabin in a Tyvek 
uh, which is a house wrap. And the important parts about Tyvek are that it um, weatherproofs the um, plywood on the outside so it protects it from moisture and rain and things like that. But more importantly, it actually um, creates basically a wind barrier so that all the draft through the cracks in your plywood is totally sealed up. So it makes it really um, airtight. You get the whole thing wrapped with Tyvek. Um, and then for the roof, you wanna do some kind of underlayment like tar paper, lapped, um, and you start at the bottom and work your way up because otherwise the lapping doesn't work. So you do your tar paper lapped up and over the roof and that basically creates a, a good waterproof seal on the roof, um, which will go underneath your sheet metal roofing or shingles or whatever you wanna do. Uh, then it's time to install all your doors and windows. Look up some videos on shimming and window installation. Depending if you're using wood windows or uh, vinyl windows, there's kind of a different process for either one. And then I used like a expanding foam sealer to go around all the cracks in the windows to make sure that you got a good seal from the elements and also things like bugs. Uh, the next step that I did was insulating the whole cabin. Since I framed the cabin with two by sixes, I was able to get uh, a lot more insulation into the walls with a uh, two by six instead of a two by four. And so you go in, I did fiberglass bat insulation through all the walls and then covered all that with a vapor barrier. So something like a nine mil uh, polyurethane vapor barrier around all of it. I didn't do the roof because um, my insulation that I put in there is all paper craft face, which is essentially a vapor barrier in and of itself. And you're not supposed to put two vapor barriers together because you can get condensation buildup between them. The summer that I built this cabin was really sunny, beautiful weather. Uh, and in fact, a really horrible wildfire came in the day that I started framing the floor. I had just brought out thousands of dollars worth of lumber, dropped it off at the property. And that day we saw a little plume of smoke off in the distance. And uh, within a few hours, we started getting um, phone calls and alerts saying that there was a wildfire coming our way. This wiped out the entire valley, came all the way up within a quarter mile of my cabin. You can actually see the burned trees from my windows where that fire came up to. I just got really, really lucky and the fire was uh, stopped at that, that barrier. It actually did go um, past my cabin, but around the edges. Uh, anyway, point is it was sunny all summer and the, the building project got delayed because of that fire. Uh, once we finally got out to start building, the day we started framing, it just started pouring rain. It was in August and that's the rainy season up here. And it just rained and rained and rained. So we built the entire cabin basically in a torrential downpour until we finally got the roof put on and sealed in. And then it, of course, totally stopped raining. It was beautiful after that. But the sooner that you get the cabin weathered in, uh, the better. So that way all your wood is protected and you don't have to worry about the elements. You can just do the fun building projects at your own leisure after that. But like I said, don't let your weathering in step be the last step because the next parts are what really brings it to life and makes it feel like a cabin. Uh, with that said, let's move on to number six. So the next big step with building a cabin is gonna be what I'll call the install phase. And that's gonna be putting in um, permanent things that uh, you will wanna have done before you do any of the interior siding, such as a wood stove, um, any kind of plumbing that you plan to do, or electrical wiring, uh, outlets, ceiling fan, things like that. And uh, for my cabin, that was pretty straightforward since I didn't do any plumbing, it's a dry cabin. Uh, the biggest one was putting in this wood stove and then wiring it. So installing your wood stove can be a little bit tricky depending on the style of flashing that you do on the roof. Uh, basically, I just went up with a sawzall and cut a hole in the roof from the inside after doing um, a lot of measurements with a plumb. So you can hang like a string from the top where you want it to exit and that'll hang down straight and that'll tell you where your chimney is going to be. And then there's two different types of ways to seal up your chimney. One of them is with what's called flashing, which is a big metal um, piece that comes up and around the chimney that you have to cut your sheet metal roofing and install it up and under so that the rain would roll over the top of it. Uh, well, what I did was uh, called a boot. And so it's a big uh, silicone boot that um, comes down. You slide it over the top of the chimney and then um, you uh, screw it in around the chimney with a bunch of like caulking and different things like that to fill up the, fill up the edges to make it watertight. It's a good option for um, different pitches of roofs because it's adaptable to all the different pitches that your roof might be. All right, so I'll give you guys a look at my electrical setup outside. Had my uh, good buddy Mason from high school come up and wire my cabin for me. He's an electrician these days, so um, it was nice to have a friend who could do it since uh, electricity is not anything I know about. Pretty simple setup. We have a grounding wire that goes down that's to a big uh, buried grounding rod and then a master plug that goes in. So all the electricity from the generator, all the in for the cabin is right here. And then we've got a, um, a outlet set here for plugging in things to the outside before we plug in the Christmas lights or tools or different things like that. Yeah, really simple. And uh, we did outlets on all the walls and in the loft and then ran some cable up to the peak of the ceiling that I installed my um, 
uh, ceiling fan from. So again, you need to have all this stuff done before you do any kind of interior trim. Another thing that I forgot to mention earlier is that the floor is insulated during framing. So I went in with closed foam slats and put one in between each floor joist and then um, sealed all the edges of them. So I had a waterproof and vapor proof seal uh, insulated floor before putting anything else together. You don't want to have to crawl underneath your cabin and pack insulation up that way. So make sure to insulate your floor before you put the decking on. Forgot to mention that. But once you're all done with that comes the fun part and uh, brings us to our final step. So this next step is something that personally took me years to complete and it's still not completed. I think of all sorts of little projects that I'd love to finish, but making it look good is going to be everything from doing your flooring to your interior siding, your exterior siding, um, all the appointments on the inside like your kitchen, bringing in couches, the railing for your loft, the stairs, so many different little things. And of course this will be different for everybody. For the interior, I've got what's called knotty pine tongue and groove. And if you're going for that cabin look, you really can't beat it. If you look closely, you can kind of tell that the um, pieces aren't as wide as a typical six inch piece of tongue and groove, but um, it's a lot cheaper and it's thinner. It's d technically designed to be installed over drywall, but I installed mine straight to the studs without any problem. Um, and then going up to the ceiling, same thing, tongue and groove all the way around. And um, this process took me a really long time because again, it was weathered in and livable. So, you know, we were kind of more focused on coming out and having fun rather than doing building projects. But the nice thing is you can take your time and get it right and um, work at your own leisure because you're, you're weathered in and you can be enjoying your cabin while working on it. I definitely spent a couple years in this cabin just with uh, vapor barriered walls and um, plywood floor and then doing things like the trim and uh, putting in light fixtures. But just accept that this will always be a work in progress. You'll never feel like it's done. The last thing I'll tell you guys about is my exterior siding. And uh, I'll take you guys out there and show you that. So the exterior siding is kind of your final step. And uh, you can do any number of different things depending on the look that you want to do. So what I did was um, what's called board and batten with um, rough cut spruce boards uh, from the local area. And uh, you know, you just kind of go in, install the first layer and then every other. So they're kind of lapped. All right, so the question I know a lot of you are dying to know is how much did it cost to build this cabin? And while it's really hard to say exactly what it costs over the years to totally finish the cabin, I'll tell you guys this. Over the course of a year and a half, I saved up $7,000 and I had 7,000 bucks in my bank account when I first went to the lumber store to start purchasing this stuff. And with that 7,000 bucks, I was able to get all of my materials for foundation and framing. After that, you can kind of go on a month to month basis and whatever uh, cash flow you have to throw into the cabin, you can do it. But um, for under $10,000, I was able to put this 16 by 20 cabin together. It, of course, it's important to keep in mind that this was about seven or eight years ago and lumber prices have definitely changed. I know right now they're trending a lot lower than they were a couple years ago when they were astronomically high during COVID. Like I said earlier, this lot cost me $10,000. Um, I was able to clear it all for free and I built the cabin for another 7,000 bucks. So for $17,000, I went from zero to cabin in the woods. I know people feel stuck and overwhelmed in a cycle of paying their bills and working their day job and that getting off grade is something that just seems impossible to do. Um, but remember that these things don't happen overnight. I've had this dream since I was about 17 years old and it started by then moving to Alaska, starting to figure out how all this stuff worked and then finally purchasing the land. And then it wasn't until a couple years later that I had enough money to start putting the cabin in. So I'm not a rich man by any standard. So it just took a lot of saving and planning and piece by piece, I was able to accomplish this dream. All right, like I said, I do have a very special announcement for you guys. I've decided that I'm gonna build another cabin here on the property this summer. So I'm gonna document the whole thing and make videos of it so you guys can come along for the ride. And uh, it's gonna be a small guest cabin over where my shed is now. So I'm gonna have my shed moved and put in a guest cabin. I've always got all sorts of friends coming over and uh, staying the night. And there's just too many people in my cabin at one time. So I decided that a little bunkhouse slash guest cabin would be a really fun project to do. So uh, stick around, subscribe to the channel for more of that. It's gonna be a fun build. It's gonna be a great summer. And I just wanna say thank you to all my subscribers out there. I really appreciate you guys watching. And uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, please do. And I'll catch you guys on the next episode of Alaska Cabin Adventures.